for sale securities. So is, is, do we have the same issue with trading securities? No, because no, selling them doesn't do anything. The, the effect that you're going to have on your income statement is the same either way. You sell it or you keep it, it's all going to affect net income the same way. Yep. All right. Example number four, no significant influence cost method. This is super easy, super straightforward. We should just skip it. How long do we have? Five minutes. We're going to skip this. I will write down the answers and then you can think about it on your own. It's super easy. Basically, you put it on your books for the amount you originally paid for it. And then when you receive the dividends, you record that, and that's all you ever do. Copy that out real quick. Think about that on your own. It's very, very straightforward. So we really don't need to spend any time on it. Yeah. Line. All right. So, quick recap of some of the things we just dealt with. Fair market value used when the investor has no significant influence over the investee. Typically, that's when we have less than 20%. Equity method, when used when you have significant influence but no control, between 20 and 50%. Consolidations, when you own more than 50%. Um, and it talks a little bit about what is significant influence, what is control. I'll let you read that on your own. And the last topic here in these notes is the equity method. All right, so we've seen an example of trading securities and available for sale. We will do um, held to maturity when we get to chapter 14. We're going to do equity method here, and we will never do consolidations in this class. That will be in an advanced accounting class. So there's basically three methods that you're going to need to actually know how to do in this class. Equity method, um, I mean in this chapter, sorry. Equity method, trading, and available for sale. When we get to chapter 14, we will add the uh, health and maturity method. The equity method, once again, is for equity only. This can't be for debt. When we have significant influence but not control. The rule of thumb is we own between 20 and 50% of the shares of this other company. We use the equity method. It is a little bit weird. It's sort of somewhere in between consolidation and the passive investment account we just did. It's, it's kind of a something in between those two things. It's, it's not either of them, but it's somewhere in between. You do have an investment account that goes on as a long-term asset on your balance sheet, so it's similar to the, the passive investments in that way, but some of the ways we account for it is sort of more like consolidation method, as you'll see as we, as we do it. So when we record the initial acquisition, just like all the other times, we're going to debit the investment and credit cash for the amount we pay for it. So that's real straightforward. And then you're going to make adjustments at, at certain times. The first adjustment that we make is that we're going to record the percentage share of the investee's net income as an increase in our investment. In other words, we own 40% of the shares of company A. Company A reports net income of $100,000. We're going to take 40% of the $100,000, $40,000, and we're going to increase our investment by that amount, and we're going to record investment income for that amount. That sort of makes sense? So our portion of their net income, we're going to record as investment income on our financial statements. When we're dealing with passive investments, what happens when the firm um, has net income? Nothing happens, or it may be indirectly the stock price changes, but that's an indirect thing, and then the stock price changes the fair value. But when net income is reported, nothing happens when you're using a passive investment. With this one, 
your portion of that net income increases your investment account. Next thing, record percentage share investees net loss, which is basically the same thing. If they lose, it's just the opposite journal entry. And then, record dividends paid by the investee. Okay, so before we look at this, what we just did with our passive investments, what happens when we receive a dividend? We debit cash, record with the cash, and we credit what? Dividend revenues. Revenues. Revenue or income, right? Something that's increasing our net income. That's not what happens here. When we have significant influence, we basically are saying, we have some influence on whether or not this firm pays out dividends. If the firm pays out dividends, what is happening? It is the owners taking money out of the company and, and giving it back to themselves. Okay? So uh, a kind of a, a simple example of thinking about this is, let's pretend like you have an investment in a bank account. What happens when you take money out of the bank account? The value of the bank account does what? It goes down. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do here. So instead of having investment income, we reduce the asset itself, the investment, when we take that money out. Okay, so with the passive investment, it's debit cash, credit investment income, or revenue. With this one, we're reducing the asset when we pay out a dividend. We reduce the value of our asset when we take that dividend payment out. Does that at least sort of make sense? Okay. All right, this next one is the tricky, tricky part. So there are a couple adjustments that are made because the way that the firm accounts for the, their assets and liabilities, et cetera, are different than what it would be if you actually bought the assets yourself. And so there's usually at least two major adjustments we'll make. In this class, we're only going to deal with one of them. There's usually an adjustment for inventory and there's an adjustment for long-term assets. We're only going to deal with the long-term asset one. And so I'll read through this, and it won't make sense, and then we'll try to do the example, and it still won't make sense, but I'll try to explain it uh, when we do that. It, this is a little tricky idea here. So when the purchase price is greater than the book value of the net, a net assets acquired, we might need to adjust the investment and the investment income account. In other words, the firm that we have an investment in has assets, and they're depreciating those assets using their book value of those assets. But if we were to acquire those assets ourselves, it would be a different number. It would not be their book value, it would be a fair value on the date of acquisition of this investment, and then we would depreciate those assets down if we were buying them ourselves. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to make an adjustment and pretend that we're depreciating those assets using the price that we would take if we were to actually buy those assets ourselves. I don't know if that helps, but that's what we're doing. Okay. The idea is to calculate the investor's profits and losses based on the investor's implicit cost in the individual assets and liabilities of the investee, not on the amount carried on the investee's books. So in other words, if, if, if instead of just making an investment in this other company, if we instead just bought the same assets that the company has, we would then depreciate the fair value of those assets as of that acquisition date. We're essentially pretending like that's what we're doing. When the investment, and so we'll do an adjusting entry that looks like this and when the example makes more sense. When the investment is sold, record the realized gain or loss measured as the difference between the selling price and the current book value of the investment, remove the investment account. Great. Let's do an example. Equity method. Grace Company purchased 10,000 shares of Sam, Co Sam Company's outstanding common stock at the beginning of 2004. On that date, Sam had 40,000 shares outstanding with a market price of $12.50 per share. So Grace's investment is 25%. How do we get the 25%? divided by 40 is 25%. So when you have 25%, what method are you going to use? The equity method. Very good. Also assume that 25% ownership allows Grace to exert significant influence over the operations of SAM, but not control, 
on the date of acquisition, the following information concerning Sam Company is available. Okay, so we acquired 25% of this other company. We have significant influence over this other company. We're going to use the equity method. On the date that we acquire that 25% ownership, this is, these are the book values. This is basically the balance sheet minus the, well, yeah, no, this is the whole, whole entire balance sheet. Uh, this other company we're acquiring, and then we also have some market values, fair market values, of a couple items that we're going to need that information for. We're going to come back to this when we do the adjustment. There were no intercompany any intercompany transactions during the year. We're not going to ever deal with those, so don't worry about those. Sam paid twenty twenty thousand dollar dividend on this date and reported ordinary income of seventy five thousand and extraordinary income of six thousand. Record all necessary journal entries on the books of Grace Company. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to record the acquisition of this investment. And so it's twelve dollars and fifty cents per share. We bought ten thousand shares. So we're going to determine how much we pay for it. <coughs> Excuse me. That's going to give us $125,000 that we have to pay for it. So we're going to credit cash, $125,000, and we're going to debit. We're going to debit this investment in Sam Company for $125,000. So far, so good. Then we are going to receive a dividend, and we received a dividend. Oh, sorry, Sam paid twenty thousand dollars. We don't get all twenty thousand; we just get our share of that. So we're going to take twenty thousand, and we're going to multiply that by twenty-five percent because we only get a fourth of the dividends that are paid out. And so we're going to get five thousand dollars. And so we're going to debit cash five thousand, and we're going to credit what? the investment asset account. So we're going to reduce our investment in SAM by $5,000. Because we basically took out $5,000 out of that and we, we now have the cash instead of the investment is basically what we did. Okay. Next, at the end of the year, uh, Sam reported earnings of 75 of ordinary income and 6,000 of extraordinary income, and we are going to record our portion of that. So once again, we're going to take these 75 and get 25% of that, which is going to give us 18,750. We're going to take these 6,000 and get 25% of that. We're going to get 1,500, and then we're going to increase our investment in Sam. by the summation of those two, which is 20250 And then we're going to separately record investment income that's ordinary of 18750 and investment income that's extraordinary or extraordinary. One thousand five hundred, and then when we create our income statement, we'll put the ordinary income with our ordinary income, and the extraordinary income with our extraordinary income. So it would fall into the same categories on our income statement as it did theirs. Any questions? Hopefully, no one's brains have turned off at this point. We're getting it a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you did a lot tonight. A lot. I don't understand why we're reducing our investment account when we receive the dividend. So the the example of the bank account is the best example I, I know of. Is we have an investment in the bank account. If we take money out of it, then it's worth less. And the same thing is happening here. We take, we take cash out of this investment that we have. That company now has $5,000 less of cash, so it's worth less. $5,000. That's the idea. Can you just mind the last part one more time? 
which the, the, these two? I guess the whole thing. The whole thing. Okay, so basically what we do is the company that we have this investment in, we take our portion of their earnings and we increase the asset by that amount. So their earnings total, um, what, $81,000. And so we took one fourth of the 81, which is the 2250, and we increased our asset by those earnings. And we recorded investment income for the same amount, and we separated between the two different types that they had 25% of the ordinary income, 25% of the extraordinary income. And we recorded income of that amount. Okay. All right. So the next thing we need to do is the adjustments. So, the adjustment happens because when we bought this company and we paid the $125,000 for it, the assets that they are depreciating when they record their net income are this, this number right here. So they have depreciable assets of $400,000. And so they're depreciating that, and we're gonna assume that they're depreciating over 10 years, straight line, no salvage value, just to make life easy. So we're, go we're going to assume that they're depreciating $40,000 each year, okay? But if we were to buy the assets, the fair market value of those same assets is actually $450,000. So there's $50,000, the difference between these two numbers, we're basically going to, we're going to pretend like they depreciated that other $50,000 as well. We don't have to worry about the non-depreciable assets because they don't depreciate anyways. Another way of saying what I just said is that this journal entry right here, we're basically recording too much here because they didn't depreciate enough. They should have had more depreciation. So we're going to back out part of this journal entry right here. The amount we're going to back out is the difference between the 450 and the 400, which is 50. 450 minus 400 equals 50. So $50,000 is that additional amount we want to, of assets that we want to depreciate. They're depreciating over 10 years, so that's going to be 5,000 additional depreciation each period. But we will only have the effect of a quarter of that, because we're only recording a quarter of their earnings, and so we only record a quarter of the depreciation. And so we're going to multiply that by 25%, and that's going to give us 1,250. And essentially, that 1,250, we're going to do the exact opposite journal entry of what we just did for their net income. And we're going to debit investment income, ordinary, 1,250, and we're going to credit the investment and Sam the same amount. This is essentially fixing the previous journal entry by pretending like we depreciated additional amounts because of the fair value versus the book value of the assets. All right. Why is it important? I mean, why? Is it, it, it could be significant in many cases. So in this case, it's not a huge number. But many firms have assets sitting on their books way less than their actual value. And so when you acquire investment in it, you, you are basically recording way too much um, when they're recording net income. It should be a much smaller number. Okay. And so this, sometimes this can get rid of almost all of your earnings from these things, if the difference is big enough. Uh, the other adjustment for inventory is usually a little bit smaller than this one, so that's why I picked this one to do, and to not overwhelm you, we're going to ignore the inventory adjustment. All right, so what's going to be on the financial statements for, our, for this guy right here? Our investment is going to be a long-term asset, and the value is going to be the adjusted value. So it's going to be this 125 minus the 5, plus the 20,250 minus the 1,250, or in other words, we'll make a T account, investment in Sam, 
We originally put 125,000 in it. We decreased it by five. We increased it by 2250, and then we decreased it by 1250. And so our adjusted ending balance is 139,000, which is the amount that's going to go on our balance sheet. So with the passive investments, they get marked to their fair value at the end of each period. This one, no. It's adjusted by these, at least these three things, the dividends, the earnings of the other company, and this adjustment for the uh, additional depreciation. On the income statement, we're going to have 17,500 of ordinary income. That 17,500 is the difference between the 2250 and the 1250. We look back to the previous page and see that we had investment income ordinary of 20. Is that right? Is that wrong? No, it should be 18750. Oh, yeah, it's the 18750 minus the 1250, which gives us the 17500. And then we have the 1500 on extraordinary income. The, the net effect is 19,000. In the operating section, we would record dividends because dividends are always in the operating section of 5,000. And in the investing section, we purchased the investment for 125. So cash would go out. The only thing we didn't do with the within this problem was sell this investment. If we did, whatever amount we had in our investment account would go away. Um, and we received whatever cash we received, then we have a gain or a loss for the difference. And that, and that would be all that would happen. All right, so I know we went through this very quickly. Um, you have a lot of work to do between now and next week to prepare for the quiz. Um, so maybe don't do the Excel assignment this week. Maybe spend this week preparing for the quiz. Maybe do this Excel assignment during spring break. That might be a better idea. Yes? On the quiz and the exam? Um, I don't remember. Let, uh, let me tell you exactly what I asked for on the quiz. So yeah, for question number two, which is the equity method one, I give you the information and then I say prepare any necessary journal entries under the equity method for investments and I tell you that there's four of them. But I don't tell you what they are. What's that again? Uh, I just say record all the journal entries for the equity method for this investment. And I do tell you there's four of them so you know that you need to do four. And then I ask what's going to be the amount on the balance sheet. And that's the other question I ask. So, if you can do this problem, you will have no problem doing the quiz problem. If you can't do this problem, you will have a problem doing the quiz problem. They're all scary in this space. Say again? What about the depression on the Which one? Available for sale? Yeah, I will. I will. I also going to provide that for the So question number one on the quiz, which is worth six points, doesn't tell you what is the category. You have to determine the category. You're going to say this is consolidation method, and it's not this one because uh, it's not debt. You can say it's not this one because it's uh, you know more than fifty percent of the shares, so it has to be consolidation. It's not this one because we own more than fifty percent of the shares, so it has to be consolidation, etc. And then you are going to report the journal entries associated with it. So which ones do you know the journal entries for? Trading, available for sale, and equity method. It has to be one of those three because you don't know how to do the other two. You still need to be able to describe why it's not the other two, but you know it can't be the other two on the quiz. Does that make sense? Okay.
If you do have questions between now and next week, feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll try to be here a little bit before class time next week, so if you do have any last minute questions, I can answer those. Um, it's a lot to take in all in one class period. You have a week to try to uh, resolve it all in your brain and get it to, to all fit. Do you think that you give us a couple of practice questions? Um, so the questions in here, on the ones we just did, are very similar to what you're going to see on both the exam and on the quiz. And, and then you have a bunch of uh, textbook questions that are all, many of them are very similar as well. I think you have plenty. Um, I don't think I've ever had anyone exhaust all those and really need them. So once you've exhausted all those and you need more, let me know, but it's never happened. So. Plus, you can use any of the other questions in the back of the textbook because um, you have the solutions to all those as well. All right, let me make sure I did everything I need, and then we will pass out the cool exam and so talk about that. Man, is every class period from now on out going to be like this? 